All right, but let's forget about attacking and let's forget about getting crazy and all of these things. Let's see what's the problem that we have and let's try to solve it in a way that we get into a position that we like. For example, as we have said before, the problem is that their queen is not working, the rook is not yeah. working, the other rook is not working. This knight maybe is gonna go to e5, uh, to e5 to generate problems. And once we know all of the problems that we have, then we try to solve them, right? How do we do that? Then we imagine. We sit down and we say, well, maybe my ideal scenario is to have my queen, let's say, on d2, my rook on c1, my rook on d1, my knight on e5, and eventually maybe even double up on the c file or something like that so that I can generate pressure on this file. Maybe even yeah. if I play queen d2, then I'm threatening to play moves like bishop h6, and if I get rid of... Um, of this bishop on g7, then I'm generating weaknesses in the dark squares of the other guy. Remember yeah. when I told you that maybe if we trade this bishop, that could be annoying? So yeah. that could be a part of our plan. Maybe our ideal scenario is something like a rook on c1, or rook on d1, or queen on d2, or bishop on h6, uh, maybe even or knight coming to g5 in certain circumstances, maybe or knight coming to e5. And those are like the guy or the the things that we are trying to follow, right? In the long term, what we want to do in this position. So, once we know what we want to do, also, of course, we have to consider the pawn structure. Um, as I told you before, this might be something that we want to play for to generate a backward yeah. pawn here. So, here, see how with the black pieces, I'm simply solving my problems and just trying to improve the position of my pieces. I do not throw an attack. Why? Because I do not have any potential to generate an attack right now. The position is too balanced. The position, uh, I do not have the control of the center. We're going to talk a little bit about this later, but this is something that we have yeah. to see. I am not throwing an attack right now. I'm just solving my problems. So, bishop f5. And in this position, you played rook e1. But the problem that I see with rook e1 is that e4 is probably not going to be a move that you're going to play uh, and have a good outcome of it. Because it is a square which is really protected right now. And it might be really difficult for you to try to take advantage of that square and play something like e4, right? Yeah. So, if that's the case, maybe we do not want to move our rook to d1, uh, sorry, to e1, because if we do that, then we're not actually doing anything to favor our position and to get into the ideal scenario that we have in mind. Does that make sense? Yeah. Also, that makes sense, yeah. In this position, we can see that maybe the pawn on d5 is a little bit quick, maybe the pawn on b7 is a little bit quick, and maybe we could play a move like queen b3 in order to try to generate some pressure in the position. For example, queen b3, and then maybe a move to try to defend both pawns could be simply to play something like knight a5 and then try to play knight c4. Let's see how our queen is getting out of the way of our rooks, and that's something that we want to do. That could be nice. Yeah. At the same time, if the knight goes to a5 to generate some pressure on the queen, the knight is going out of the center of the board and it's getting to one of the sides. That could be nice for us. So just throwing some ideas, right? Also, yeah. maybe rook c1 is another move that we want to play because this file is already open, whereas this one has the potential to get open someday, but it's not clear when, right? Yeah. Also, yeah. another move that we could play is simply knight e5 and try to generate pressure in the position. And those are like the candidate moves that we have now. Rook e1, not so much for what I just told you. It is not so clear how to play e4 in this position, right? It, it might take many attempts before you to do that. Another move could be simply like queen d2, which is a move that's getting you towards your objective of developing your pieces towards the active squares, and that could be nice for you. So once you have yeah. seen all the, the moves that you have and all the things that you can do, you have to try to select one of them. For example, you sit down here and you say, well, if I play rook e1, then maybe that's nice because somewhat or somehow I'm just bringing my rook out of f1, but at the same time is my rook so much better on e1 than on f1. Never really. It's from what you said about the the e4. It's not it's not doing anything. Exactly. Then we jump off that, because in this position, of course, there is not a lot of tactics on the board, nobody's going crazy, so we can play strategical here. Then we go about queen b3, for example, and then we say, well, queen b3 makes sense because I'm generating pressure here, I'm generating pressure here, and then we dive into the possibilities of queen b3, and then we say, well, if I play queen b3, let's say knight a5, then I can play maybe even queen b4. If I do play queen b4, I'm generating pressure on the knight on a5, I'm generating pressure on b7 at the same time, I'm just giving some space to my rooks to come out. Eventually, maybe even my knight can maneuver in a 
fa in this fashion and try to take advantage of the opponent of the of the square c5 and then we start to imagine a little bit right and we yeah. try to figure out what to do we go through the calculations and we decide that, rook b, uh, that queen b3 makes sense also then we jump to the next line and then we say, well, maybe we have knight e5 with a d of generating pressure on c6. If knight takes e5, then maybe I could even take with a d-pawn and try to generate some pressure on the knight on f6. If the knight goes backwards, for example, let's say knight d7, then I have a really strong center for the moment, and I might even play something like queen d4 in the future with a d of giving a space to my queen, to my pieces, and generate threats, and you go on, right? See how we're just yeah. throwing some ideas. But they come out yeah. of the evaluation. Because if we jumped... Uh, just into conclusions without having gone through the whole idea of um, analyzing the situation that you are facing, your moves are not going to be based on reality, but maybe they are going to be biased into something that you think is happening, but maybe it's not because of the relativeness of the position. Does that make sense? Yep. Perfect. So, rookie one, all right, I mean, it's a move, but it's probably not the best move. Another move could have been simply rook c1, queen b3, or knight d5 which are the moves that I wanted or that I'd like to see in this position, right? So due to the fact that my position is more or less the same than yours, uh, I don't think we have to go through uh, the same thing one more time, right? The, the idea is more or less clear. So what I want to do is yeah. probably queen b6, rook c8, or knight, e4, or knight e4, right? How come? Yeah. Because I want to generate pressure. Also, if we trade, if we trade a couple of pieces here, what's going to be happening is that we're getting into a more or less equal position if I do play knight e4, for example. And if I get into that, then I can work in the position because, of course, I am the black pieces and try to generate a little advantage in the future. But first of all, I have yep. to get the equality, right? So, knight e4, and here you played knight e5. So knight takes c3, yep. b takes c3, and now I'm generating unbalances. Now I feel like I have a little advantage because this pawn is something that I have as a target. Eventually, I can try to generate pressure here. I can try to go there with my pieces and try to take this pawn in the future. Also, you have an isolated pawn on a2, which could be something dangerous for you. And this is something that you yeah. didn't consider. You saw that after the fact, but not before the fact. Because in this position here, you said that your pawn structure was horrible, right? You said that though your pawn on e5 yeah. is not so good, your pawn on c3 does not look right, your pawn on a2 does not look right. But now you have already played the position and you cannot go backwards and see what happened. Why is this happening? Because you're not evaluating one more time. You're not saying that if I take here, then after pawn takes, then this is not gonna be so nice. This is gonna be a target for me to play and to attack, and this is gonna be probably a target for me to, to attack in the future. So, due to the things that we have just said, maybe a move to try to solve the problem that knight takes c3 is, uh, is getting your a backward pawn and an isolated pawn, a move could have been simply to play rook c1. Because if I take here on c3 now, you can even take with your rook on c3, and then you do not have double, uh, you do not have isolated pawns, and you do not have a backward pawn. Does that make sense? Yeah, yep, it does. But see how we have to see what's happening on the board, and we cannot just jump to conclusions. Here you said, well, I want to play knight d5, but the problem that you have if you play knight d5 is that you allow me to take on c3. You take on c3. And then suddenly all of these arrows appear on the board and things start to look complex, right? It is not yeah. uh, so easy to play with the white pieces anymore. It is starting to get a little bit harder. So I take on e5 because I figure that if I play something like knight takes e5, then I might destroy even a little bit more your pawn structure and I can try to take advantage of that. So that's important for us. See how all of these things that I'm considering are, are things that you are not seeing and are things that you should try to see. Of course, yeah. it might be um, a little bit overwhelming, right? Like, wow, but this is a lot. You're thinking about a lot of things in this position, but if you think about it, it's just little clues in terms of a strategic game, right? It's just like, we see that we don't want to have an isolated pawn, we do not, we do not want to have a uh, backward pawn, we do not want to have these double up pawns here, maybe what's a move that we can play to try to avoid that, etc. right? So. Just little by little, we're constructing an idea of what's going on on the board without just throwing moves about the position. We can throw our candidate moves once we have evaluated the position, and then we can have a better sense of what's going on. So, knight takes, pawn takes, e sits, right? Because I have to defend on the e5, and at the same time, um, probably I'm just simply going to play something like this and generate pressure. See what I, what I am doing here? 
evaluating one more time. So I am not going, um, or I'm, I am not playing ch um, superficial chess here, which would be simply to say, well, in this position, maybe I want to play rook c8 or something like that, and just consider the fact that I want to move my rook to a half open file. I'm also thinking that maybe yeah. if I do that, the pawn on d5 is falling, right? Yeah. So we, all, we see all the facts on the board one more time, and we say, well, what do we want to do? What's the problem that I have? What do I have to solve? I am the black yeah. pieces here, right? So, my king is on g8, that means that I am castle, my king is safe, my bishop on g7 seems to be generating pressure on e5, that's nice, the bone is a little bit weak, your bishop, uh, um, my bishop on f5 seems to be in an active square, at the same time my rook are out of the game, I want to bring them into the game, but nonetheless at the same time my pawn on, um, on d5 is falling. So, my biggest problem right now is that the pawn on d5 is falling. So how do I solve that? Of course, my other problems are my rook are on a8 and on f8, and I want to solve that. But if I don't solve this one, the priority here on d5, then, then I am losing material, and I don't want to lose material. So yeah. how do I solve that problem? What can you see in this position? What are the candidate moves? So candidate, a silly candidate move would be your bishop to e6, but the, the main one I can see is e6. All right, there are at least three candidate moves in this position. One of them is e6, because I'm simply defending. The bad side of e6 is that my bishop does not have a lot, a lot of squares to go back if anything happens here. For example, like these kind of moves, I have to be really careful with that. Um, nonetheless, if I do play bishop e6, then my bishop is going backwards. And also what's happening is that my bishop is now crashing against one of my pawns, which means that the yeah. mobility of my bishop is not so good. Another move that I have in this position is rook c8, which could work because even though I lose a pawn on d5, you're losing a pawn on c3, right? Yeah. And the problem, the problem in this position is that, um, first of all, I am generating weaknesses in my position because my pawn on b7 is falling after bishop takes, for example. I am getting rid of one of your weaknesses on c3 that I want to exploit, and that means that I am helping you. So I don't want to help you. I consider rook yeah. c8, I go like, no, rook c8 is not working. I consider bishop e6, after I evaluate and I calculate a little, of course, I go like, I don't want to play bishop e6. Because if I do that, I feel like I'm getting into a passive position. At the same time, moves like this might be generating pressure on the position. I don't want to see that. Maybe rook b1 yeah. is coming, etc. I go and I discard bishop e6, right? So, I go for e6, and I think about it for a while, and I realize that I like the move, and I go for it, right? I think about the repercussions of the move. I think I, cal I calculate about it, and then I go like, all right, bishop, um, uh, e sits is a move that I want to play. So I played e sits, you played e4. Um, there is a problem with e4. What is it? It uh, blocks my light square bishop. All right, what else? It's... It's not really doing too much because I still have my rooks not connected and I haven't moved my queen to, to fix that or generated pressure with my queen. Because I'm all right. still in that position, queen b3 is good. All right, so see what you're saying here? The inherent problem with e4 is that you're not solving the problem that you have in the position, right? Yeah. If we think of, about the problem that we have right now, what, what is it? My queen is still interfering between my rooks. My rooks yep. are still inactive. My pawn on c3 is that weakness that I yep. sh would like to get rid of. My pawn on e2 is a weakness, and my pieces are not working pretty well. Also, conceptually, yep. when it comes to the fundamentals of chess, when we have a bad pawn structure, if we trade a lot of pieces, what's happening is that we're helping the other guy because we're getting into a position where the abilities are more obvious, are gonna be more representative. For example, if we trade all the pieces now, right, all, all of them, let's imagine that the only yep. thing that there are left are pawns, who yep. do you think has the advantage here? Uh, definitely black. Because of this pawn structure, right? Yeah. So, if you trade pieces, if you trade this guy for this one, and you're not solving the problem that you have, what's happening is that you are getting into the, the position where there are just kings and pawns. 
right? And you're helping me because you're basically uh, getting into the position that I want to get to materialize my advantage, which is to trade pieces, leave you with these two pawns, and then try to take advantage of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. So, what are your candidate moves in this position, considering all the facts that we have just talked about? So, uh, the two candidate moves from what you've just said, I would say it'd be queen b3, defending that weakness, applying a bit of pressure to you, or the other one you had showed, uh, queen d2, because it would protect the pawn and can also bring the bishop to h6. Okay, see how now that makes a little bit more of sense. Why? Because we're throwing moves to solve the problems. Also, I would add to those moves maybe c4, because if I play c4, I'm getting rid of one of my weaknesses, and I'm trying to generate a weakness in your position, for example. So let's say that I take on c4, right, yeah. then you can even take on the 8th, I take on the 8th, and you can take on b7, for example, or even there are moves like e4 happening, right? And maybe my bishop is falling. So that's right. something that's not working for me. So c4 is a nice move in this position, for example, because I'm getting rid of my problem, generating a problem for the black pieces, and that's good yeah. for me. See how c4 is probably the move in this position because I'm basically improving my position and solving the problem that I have. So, yeah. c4 is probably the, the strongest move. Then maybe queen d2 because I'm solving my problem of bringing my pieces out. That's nice. But see how now the moves make way more sense. When you're playing e4, you're getting into a position where I'm trading um, a bishop, which is also one of my problems. Why is this bishop one of my problems? Because I do not have a lot of mobility. I cannot do yeah. a lot with it. I mean, even though the bishop seems to be active here, uh, what am I really doing with it? Well, that's true, yeah. So that's a problem that we have, right? So for us to realize what our plan is and for us to realize what our move is in the position, it is nice if we evaluate first. So try to incorporate this in your games. This is going to be really important. And try to force yourself into evaluating as, as often as you can so that this yep. becomes a little bit unconscious and that you can find better moves. Most people sure. at your level probably are not doing this. And if you do that, then you're gonna have an edge, you know, and you're gonna start to crush more people. So that's gonna be nice. And here, after e4, pawn takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, rook takes, I play simply queen c7 and see how the position is simple. This bishop is bad. Why is that bishop bad? It's blocked off and isn't really isn't really doing much at all. Yeah. Apart from defending a pawn. It is cut off, and also all the pawns are in dark squares, you know? And generally when yeah. all the pawns are in dark squares and they are not mobile and the pawns on the center are not mobile, they are um, blocked, and what's happening is that you have a bishop of the same color of the, of the squares of the pawn, uh, your bishop is really bad because it does not have mobility. So... In this position, this bishop does not have a lot of mobility, right? Yeah. Whereas this bishop on g7, even though it is a little bit trapped right now for your pawn on e5, is not crashing against his own his own pawns, right? And it might get yeah. some activity in the future. So that's another subtlety that we have to see in this position. Also, yeah, yeah. if we add up that the pawn on e5 would be weak if you move the bishop on e4, that means that this bishop is passive because it is defending. The pawn on yeah. c3 is not so good. The pawn on a2 is not so good. So see how I am acting according to the position and I'm playing queen c7. And also I could have played queen a5, for example. Are like the two moves that I want to play right now. I don't even necessarily want to trade queens right now because I believe that I can generate more pressure with the queens on the board. So yeah. queen c7, attacking on e5, attacking on c3, bringing my rooks out, solving my problems, not doing anything crazy. Rook e3 which is probably not necessarily the best move because you are keeping this rook on a1 in the solitude of a1. This rook is alone, sad, it's about to suicide. You have to get, ima <laughs> you have to get it out, right? So that's important yeah. for us in this position. This rook is alone, it, it is a problem that you have right now. Why don't you play rook c1, for example? Or maybe even just queen b3 so that your rook has a square to go to, like b1. Yeah. So see how one more time you're not solving the problem of the position, but you're... Uh, just throwing moves, like for example rook e3, which if anything is generating even more trouble. Your rook now is stopping your bishop from going backwards if ever needed. Also, yeah. your rook is now being a little bit overloaded because it has to defend on e5 and it has to defend on c3. Yeah. So, not necessarily the best way to proceed, right? 
Rook d8, solving my problem. My rook needs to get into the game. My other rook needs to get into the game. If I play rook f d8, there is a little, a, a little edge, which is that I am winning a 10-point rook queen. And also then I can bring my rook to c8, right? So, yep. rook d8, queen b3, h6 now, because I want to uh, generate threats like g5, that's nice. I'm forcing you to lose another tempo with your rook. Rook e2. Yep. And I'll simply bring my rook to c8 because that, that's what I want to do. Also, the bone yeah. on e5 is falling, but nonetheless, I decided that I wanted to bring even more pieces to generate more pressure. This is what we call in chess the, princi the principle of the double debility. Have you heard about it? Uh, say that again? The principle double. of double debilities. Or, or that's the way we call it in Spanish. There might be another name in English. But um, basically what it is, is that whenever you have an, a debility, it is nice to generate another one in the, in the position of your opponent. Like, for example, if I see that you have this ability here, it is nice if, if you have more debilities so that I can force you to divide your forces and try to defend all of them while I am generating more pressure on every single one of them. As you only have one move per turn in chess, that means that you are eventually not going to be able to hold all of your debilities. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. So what I am doing is moving my rook to c8 to take advantage of all the abilities that you have on the board. Eventually, probably this pawn on a2 is going to be attacked as well. And see how I could have played probably g5 in this position as well and simply win the pawn on e5. But sometimes in chess, the threat is stronger than the execution, right? Now, I'm yep. threatening this, I'm threatening this, I'm threatening this, I'm threatening everything. And that's something that's not so fun. So, yeah. rook c1. B sits to stop any counterplay that you might have with taking on a7 after g5. For example, if yep. I play g5 in this position, then bishop e3, bishop takes e5, and then bishop takes a7 could have been something annoying. And if I yep. took with my queen here, even though it is pinning your rook, uh, pinning your bishop on your rook, um, I didn't like that so much. I thought that might be tricky. So in this position, I played for the safe move, and I played simply b sits. I am not doing anything crazy. See how since the beginning of, of, the, of the game, I'm not doing anything too weird. I'm just solving my problems, you see? See how yeah. my problem is in this position, I need to develop my pieces, need to castle, need to probably go for the center eventually, need to get my bishop out, need to probably get um, good squares for my rooks, need to get out with my queen eventually, generate pressure in your position, exactly what I am doing. You see, nothing really crazy. Bishop f5, knight e4, Knight takes. Now I see that you committed a little mistake here. I try to focus my attention on the on the on the debility that you have. Generate pressure there. Force you to generate more mistakes as the position gets harder to play for you. And then I'll just simply take advantage of it slowly, yep. progressively. I'm not doing anything crazy. I'm not throwing attacks. I'm not going. I mean, this is somewhat of an attack, but I I'm just basically saying I'm not doing anything weird or esoteric or. Uh, witchcraft or anything crazy. It's just moving my pieces to the place where they need to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Because chess sometimes is mysterious, right? We see the moves of the other guys and we think that, oh my God, these guys are so crazy. And it's just, uh, of course, there are some moves which are really complex to see. But in this position, for example, we can see how plain simple is just giving us results. So, rook c1, b6, h4 to stop me from playing g5. That makes sense. Rook d5. Why rook d5? Because I'm bringing my rook to maybe get some triple option here on your pawn on c3. That might be annoying. Also, my rook on d5 generates an attack on the pawn on e5. Remember the double debility thing that I just told you? Yeah. And if I can get my rook here, for example, that means that all your pieces are going to be overloaded eventually and that I am going to get some advance due to that fact. So, rook d5, g4. And this is a big mistake. Because you're saying here, I want to throw an attack, right? But before even throwing an attack, we need to know the principles of throwing an attack, you know? So, what do you think you need to have when you're throwing an attack? I sort of the connection's breaking up there. What did you say? The connection's breaking up. All oh, right, all right. Um, let me repeat a little bit. Here you said that you wanted to, to generate an attack, right? But before even yeah. generating an attack, we have to have certain things in mind. One of them is that we need to follow the principles of attacking, basically. And what do you think do you need to have 
in order for your attack to be fruitful in chess? Well, it, I'll, I'll be honest, I kind of see my position as a losing one. Uh, so far, I was just trying to make the position more complicated. All right, but here's the thing. When we're throwing an attack, there is a line between throwing an attack and being reckless, you know? <laughs> so, sure. here. The first thing that you need to know if, you're, um, if you want to throw an attack and you want to know if that's going to work are the following concepts. Basically, you want to have the control of the center, right? If you have the control of the center, that's a green light for you. Why? Because if you control the center, then you set the dynamics on the board and your pieces have more mobility. Do you control the center in this position? No. No, right? So that's a red light in this position. That's saying us, no, maybe the attack is not going to fly right then we go about the second thing that we have to consider when we are throwing an attack and then we say well do we have more pieces attacking than the other guy has defending on the place that we want to attack what do you think about this position <laughs> nope no right like i have a bishop defending and my rook on d5 which might come to defend eventually maybe my queen coming eventually as well and you just have a bishop on a four attacking right it's just one piece and it's not enough to generate an attack, right? So, yeah. that's two red likes here. Does that make sense? Yep, makes sense. Third thing that we have to, to think of, the safety of our king, right? Who is safer in this position? Uh, your king with the, the bishop in front. Exactly, because you have all of these weaknesses around your king, right? Yep. So that's a third red light. And that's telling us, no, 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 that's not going to fly. Of course, another light that we have to consider as well are the mobility of our pieces. Who has the most mobility? Who has the better point structure? Who has the more chances of getting a result out of this attack? Is it reckless? Is it, is it not reckless? And out of all of these little factors, then we can go to the conclusion that the attack is not going to fly. For example, g4 is not only throwing an attack when you do not control the center, but also is letting the pawn on e5 falling, which is like the only thing that you had in the center to try to generate some control. That means that I can just generate counterplay on the center. Remember that when somebody is attacking on one of the flanks of the board, uh, generally the best move is to try to generate counterplay in the center. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So if you play g4, I simply can counterattack on the center and then you're just losing more material. That's not working, right? If you take yeah. on h6, then your bishop is out of the game. And uh, this simply doesn't look like something that I would like to play in this position. Like, yeah. maybe even moves like bishop f4 are coming, and that's just too strong. You know, because after you trade this bishop, then your king is alone, and there are some pieces, that, some pieces attacking, you have weaknesses, and that's probably going to be really, really difficult for you to, to, to protect. Because see how you yeah. have not only the weakness on c3, the weakness on a2, less material, but now also you generated even more weaknesses here, which could be taken advantage of. So, yeah. bishop takes e5, rook takes e5, and now we're simplifying when I want to simplify. This is going to be harder to protect your opponent down, and that's not necessarily going to fly. So, king g2, queen f4, and see how I'm attacking your rook, I'm attacking your pawn on g4, I'm attacking everybody, forcing you to go backwards, bring yeah. my pieces upwards, generate more threats, and eventually you just blunder because the pressure yeah. is so much, right? Yeah. It's really difficult to hold the position. 